So I have a question. Um, I, I want to tell you a little story uh, to start us off, but I have a question for you first. And my question for you is, uh, do you eat meat? Yes. Yeah. Like, like, yeah, if you've eaten beets before, maybe raise your hand. Okay. So, beets? A little bit. <laughs> a little bit? Okay. <laughs> so, um, so, you know what happens when you eat beets, yeah. right? Like, you know you've eaten beets, and if you don't know that you, like, if you forget that you ate beets, like, that can be really long, right? <laughs> okay, so, in Cameroon, um, <laughs> I, I was there with Lisa Jenke, who's from our synod as well, and is away at seminary right now. And uh, we, we lived in this little house, and, and we actually had a shower, which was awesome, because we're, you know, Canadians, and showers are really, really great <laughs> for four months away. And, um, and we ate a lot, because it was one thing we could successfully buy at the market. And, um, but somehow, like, I don't know if you've, like, this doesn't happen to me at home, like, it, have you gotten like water up your nose in the shower? You know, it happens once every five years or something <laughs> where you get water up your nose in the shower. Okay, well there's such a fear over the water in Cameroon that like I always got water up my nose. Like somehow I was so scared of getting water in my mouth or up my nose and I was gonna get all these germs and die and these like bacterial infections or whatever that I would like always get water up my nose in the shower. And so one day in the shower, I got soapy water up my nose. <laughs> which caused me to like spit, right? And I was like trying to get the soap and the germy bacteria laden water out of my mouth and I was spitting and spitting and spitting and it was all coming out red. <laughs> and I was so oh, no. terrified and I was like, I got the water on my nose too many times. <laughs> and of course, we had eaten beets. <laughs> so after calming down, like I really was convinced I was dying, um, after calming down, realizing, ah, the beats again, I, 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 you know, finished, went out, told Lisa the story. I was like, just in case you shower later and get water up your nose, with some soap and spit, just remember we ate beets. And sure enough, like two hours later, she goes to shower, and I hear her like panicking in the shower. And the exact same thing. I don't know how, though. Like, like this does not happen to us here, right? But this fear of water. Anyway, so this is like a little bit of what every day was like in Cameroon. Like there were just these weird things that would happen all the time because everything was different, just a little bit different. So we have this partnership with Cameroon. They're a companion and a partner. And uh, right now, one of the areas that we're focusing on is women in ministry. We also, we've also we kind of identified three areas that we'll work in so that we can frame this relationship because there's just so much right, that we could do, <laughs> do together. Um, so one area is evangelism. And so we've studied their evangelism and catechism, a catechist training programs that they have and tried to bring some of that back here. Um, the other uh, second area is an orphan program called Kids Helping Kids. And uh, yeah, and we'll talk about that a bit with the pictures. And then the third area that I specifically was working in was uh, women in leadership. And so as part of that, uh, we worked with some women who were the first women to be ordained and had uh, Catherine Birdbush, who's a retired pastor in Brazil. Um, she was with us for the first month to have some meetings with them and offer them some support and, and work through some of the things that they're struggling with being the first women ordained in a completely male-dominated culture, in a completely male-dominated church. So that was that was really exciting. And the ordination actually happened when we were there. Like, we'll talk about good news. <laughs> that was really exciting. And uh, the area that Lisa and I were working with uh, was violence prevention. And so we were working with a program called Safe Team, which is a skills-based program out of Vancouver. And uh, we were working to kind of adapt and translate the program and then train facilitators there who then would run this program with uh, teen girls. And so the next phase of that is uh, what Jean Kambami might be returning for. Um, she is studying in seminary right now in mm -hmm. Nigeria. And so we're, we're hoping that four women will arrive in our synod in August two from the ordination track to do some, uh, like what would be their um, 
old seminary for no other, what's the practicum for? Internship. Yeah, of course. <laughs> internship. <laughs> um, so they, what would be part of their internship, they'd be paired up with uh, women clergy here to, to go through some of that struggling together, talk through some of that, and do some study. Um, and then two women that were um, that are ongoing facilitators of the SEAT team program would come here as well for, for the training. Uh, so we're just kind of waiting for visas and passports to see if it's possible. So um, pictures, okay, this, so they are out of order a little bit, just, I, I, you know, like everybody has different cameras and who knows what order they're gonna be in, so I have no idea what I'm gonna be showing you, but <laughs> um, this, is, this is me driving. This is the only picture I have of me driving, and I just have to say that this is like one of my proudest it, like endeavors that I've ever undertaken driving in Cameroon and you'll see a bit more of the streets and what they're like but um, there's no there's no traffic laws like or there, there might be but I certainly never uh, found out what they were and there's no policing of like anything so definitely not traffic and people just like walk wherever right like <laughs> this is a um, a Prado, it's called, from like the 60s or 70s that has been repaired endless and rebuilt endless number of times. And the back, we had to hitch clothes with like, yeah, it, and like sometimes it just didn't start when we were out places. So you have to know the trick of like putting water on a certain part of the engine to go, like, like it's crazy. And, and it's, and it's um, all stick shift right but they're but they're like 40 years old so shifting is hilarious like sometimes there's a gear and sometimes there's not and you're doing this all while trying to to navigate streets that have no names and while trying not to run over people and so it's just like it, it was like I loved it <laughs> I love driving so this is great but but I did not drive the first two trips so this is like really exciting for me yeah woohoo oh and that's my fake wedding ring you have to you have to wear that around. Not that it stops you from being harassed, but it really does help to deter people uh, like proposing to you all the time, which happened all the time, like in markets or wherever we went. So yes, <laughs> this is the kids helping kids program. Um, so so in those pails right there is a bunch of milk powder, and you can see them holding uh, bottles of oil. And every once every month. Um, the kids will come together for a meeting and every second month they get a food supplement um, that our synod entirely funds. So this orphan program is entirely funded by us. There's 60 children and, and it's just phenomenal. Like it's, it's so amazing. It's run by two social workers, Fanta and William. And we did get some sad news recently that William actually left to return to his home village, his, his family's village, to be with his family. So they're starting with a new person. And this is like a, a sad loss because William is this totally endearing, like wonderful, like just outpouring of beautiful things in life kind of person. And so, so we're sad to see him go. And so, but, they, but the program continues on. And um, it came about because Fanta and William were social workers at the hospital and they worked in palliative care. And they uh, knew that as these adults died, these children were left behind. And there's no social programming in Cameroon. And there's kind of like nothing for these kids to do. Uh, and and so, that, so that makes them really vulnerable to everything, pretty much. And so they set up this system where they actually go and find families for the children to live in. And, um, and then bring them together once a month to give them some support, teach them how to negotiate for themselves, because that means they're probably the ninth and 10th children in that family and the last ones to get money for education or the last ones to get new shoes or whatever it is. And so um, they teach them things like that, hygiene programs, and then this food supplement program that helps those families to take on these two extra kids. So it's, it's just really, it's really wonderful. And you can see like Sorry. the kids, no, no, go ahead, that's great. That's, that's the food container. Um, it's hot. <laughs> We were there in the, the dry season, <laughs> and the end of the dry season, uh, like, 
yeah, you just you want to die actually. Like it would be like it would be better than being outside. It's so hot. And this is a metal container. And so we loaded. Uh, Fanta and William usually do this by themselves, but luckily when people from here are there to help, like it goes a lot faster. So, so we spent like hours in this metal container loading buckets of milk powder and bags of rice and bars of soap and things like that. And it's like phenomenal at the same time. Like it's really the coolest work to do even though you're spagging rice. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know where it's going, so it's really awesome. Okay, let's see what else we got here. This is my favorite. Uh, we practice this all the time. It, it, does anybody ever like really want to try this? Like whenever you see somebody carrying something on your head? Or have you seen this before? Yeah? Okay. At any time. Like, people will put anything on their head, right, to carry it, because it's way easier than walking around with it in your arms. And these kids would be like, there'd be like little, little kids and they would have like, I don't know, more than 20 pounds of stuff on their head for sure. Like super heavy bags of stuff. I just, I love it. So um, this right here, uh, this guy worked on the compound that we lived on. So we lived on a secured compound that during the day was open and then at night was guarded uh, and patrolled by guards and like gates were locked, right? And so um, he worked there, uh, Justin, and he, he washed my underwear. He did our laundry. <laughs> That's what he did. And he took care of the compound. And so one day he went to, we went to visit him on a Sunday for worship because they were having a youth, a youth Sunday and he was preaching. And so on the way home, we walked by his house and this is one tiny little room. And he's like a celebrity in his little village because he has an income and can actually take care of his family and like pay his mother's medical bills and things like that. So all these kids would just like follow him through the streets everywhere. And when, and when we went to hang out, they wanted to like crowd in for this picture. So yeah, that's what's going on there. Next, let's see. Aha. <laughs> Another, so, so this is like, this is like, you know, another part of every single day you turn on the water and sometimes water comes out and sometimes mud comes out <laughs> and, and and you never really know what you're gonna get but you do have to eat and for us to eat anything meant that we had to bleach everything that we ate so we had to fill a sink with water and put bleach in it and then soak everything all fruits and vegetables and whatever and and let it air dry to, to kill off all the bacteria so so water is always essential right but yeah when you when you can't even kind of grab a piece of fruit like it's even another layer of being super important so this is one of the groups for the first two months that we were there we met with women's groups and we met with um individual individual like university age girls that we had come across or adult women and we just heard stories about cameroon and like kind of experienced Cameroonian life um, and we were invited to visit this one jeune fille pour Christ group which is called which is like young women for Christ that might not be the direct translation but that's the idea behind it um, and we were introduced uh, as the people who had come to help the girls resist the devil so this is how deep rooted um, this like this like patriarchal culture is so that even women's own experience of violence is blamed back 